can remember as an 18 year old young saxophone player in high school crowding into Langford Auditorium and Vanderbilt University for one of their great artists performance series concerts featuring the incredible Sonny Rollins. And I remember sitting there being awestruck at what didn't feel like playing music. It, it felt like Sonny Rollins was on stage casting a spell or, uh, you know, willing beautiful music into uh, invention. It was absolutely mesmerizing. And one of the experiences that at that point made me uh, just a sucker for jazz, to say it in a, in a, in a, in a plain sort of way, um, being exposed to that sort of mastery and wisdom and humor and fun uh, just gave me quite an impression of the genre that would last. It certainly lasted, uh, you know, my entire musical life. I've always kind of looked up to Sonny Rollins. And that started looking from the audience up to the stage at Sonny Rollins when I was 18. Uh, what more can you say about such an incredible performer, uh, incredible composer, incredible saxophonist? Um, Sonny Rollins was born in 1930 in the elite part of Harlem, the Sugar Hill area. And uh, at a time where Harlem was, in, in Sonny Rollins' own words, the epicenter culturally of a lot of things. And, you know, he recounts being a young boy that was much more interested in playing baseball than playing saxophone and would often get smirks, as he says, from the great W.E.B. Du Bois, uh, who was also in the neighborhood, who would, as Sonny says, always look at him and give him the look that he should be studying a book somewhere instead of playing baseball in the streets. Uh, but ultimately, the musical family that Sonny Rollins grew up in won him over towards music. Um, at 13, his mom got him a saxophone uh, from an uncle that used to play. And uh, he joined a neighborhood band with other young kids like Jackie McLean and Art Taylor, if you can believe that, two absolute greats in jazz. And uh, he would walk past the Cotton Club uh, on his way to school. Uh, he would often go to the Apollo weekly for shows. And so everything that New York had to offer, he was taking in as a young musician. And that got him the ear of young jazz giants uh, that were already more accomplished when he was still 18 and 19 years old. One of the things that helped him in his career, which has now spanned over 70 years, uh, he's, he's over 90 now, uh, is that he embraced all of those influences that he found uh, as a young musician. And so we'll start this performance with maybe the biggest multicultural embrace for Sonny Rollins, which is his embracing of Calypso and Soca music. And so we'll start with the tune that's, I think most people, this is the tune they think of if you say Sonny Rollins, and that tune is St. Thomas. I am pleased to be joined in performance by the great Bruce Dudley on piano, Roger Spencer on bass, Chester Thompson on drums, and special guest a little bit later in the program, Lindsey Miller on guitar. Thanks so much for joining us, and I hope you enjoy this.
to get a good picture of Sonny Rollins, the beginning saxophonist, and I mean Sonny when he's 13, all the way up until he's 18, 19, and starting to take a step onto the uh, the local scene in New York City as far as jazz performance goes, we kind of have to understand the saxophonists that were tops in his ear and in his mind at the time. The two tenor players, that uh, tenor saxophone players, that really spoke to him were Lester Young and Coleman Hawkins. Uh, and there were more, of course, especially being in the New York environment. He was exposed to so many. But he speaks so highly of Lester Young's swing, his relentless swing, that for me, as I hear Sonny Rollins and I've, as I've listened to Lester Young, there's a pace to both of their playing that is unmatched in the day uh, that they were playing in. Uh, both of them just seem to be um, an encyclopedia of melodic ideas, great melodies. And that sort of swing that Lester had, I think, plays a, a large part in Sonny Rollins' development. The other tenor saxophonist is Coleman Hawkins, the great Coleman Hawkins. Uh, most of us know the great Coleman Hawkins recording of Body and Soul, which features Hawkins' signature robust sound, uh, chromatic, melodic invention, uh, his wit, and, and Rollins calls it his deep intellectualism, which is a great Sonny Rollins-esque uh, way of uh, speaking about Coleman Hawkins' wit. And so he was struck with that. And I think if you, again, if you contrast those two players, you're going to find a very similar wit in the music of Sonny Rollins. Uh, those two tenor players give a lot to the way that Sonny approaches the tenor saxophone, but there's another saxophonist who uh, gives a lot to the way that Sonny Rollins approaches jazz, and that is Charlie Parker. Uh, whereas Sonny Rollins speaks of other players, uh, peers and early influences, uh, for their musical contributions. He speaks of Charlie Parker as a prophet. He says, Charlie Parker was our prophet. He talks about being 17 years old and using makeup to fake a mustache so that he can get into the clubs and go hear Charlie Parker play. Uh, what Charlie Parker meant to him as a figure who embodied Black excellence, uh, Black cultural relevance, uh, self-empowerment, uh, compositional craft and improvisational ability uh, cannot be understated. And, and the terms that Sonny Rollins uses to describe Charlie Parker are absolutely uh, indicative of that. And so, you know, it's often be, been said that in jazz, our earliest influences always show themselves when we play a ballad. And so uh, for me, the first Sonny Rollins recording I heard was actually Sonny Rollins playing You Don't Know What Love Is, which is the next song that we'll play. And in it, I feel like you can hear big, big contributions uh, from the voices of Coleman Hawkins, Lester Young, and Charlie Parker, uh, particularly with the way that Sonny Rollins delivers the melody um, and then expands upon the themes in his solo as well. So check that recording out, but we hope you enjoy this one. Absolutely. This is Sonny Rollins's you don't know what love is.
One of the things that I treasure about Sonny Rollins as a musician is that he's not just making music for jazz diehards. He's making music for everyone. He talks about that quite a bit in many an interview, uh, wanting to make music that touches people whether they've heard jazz before or not. And one of the things that I think is a direct result of that is that Sonny Rollins is willing to play tunes that a lot of jazz musicians would never touch. Uh, he's willing to pull tunes from all sorts of places and that resulted in a really phenomenal record entitled Way Out West that our next selection comes from. And here we find Sonny Rollins playing trio with bass, bass and drums alone, no piano. And I think that says a lot for the freeness of his ear, especially when it comes to 
interpreting and reinventing tunes. Uh, this is the great I'm an Old Cow Hand. Uh, it's not a jazz standard. At least it wasn't, and now it is, thanks to Sonny Rollins' recording of it, chiefly. Uh, such an incredible creative take on a tune that doesn't come from the club scene, for sure. So we hope you enjoy. This is our version of Sonny Rollins' arrangement on I'm an Old Cow Hand. Thank you. 
One of the most mystical things about Sonny Rollins is that he does something that I don't know of any other jazz musician that does. Uh, normally, a, a musician works hard, practices, uh, gets tied into a scene, and stays in that scene as long as they can. Sonny Rollins often has periodically taken sabbaticals where he's completely retreated from working uh, just to focus on improving his craft. Uh, it's such a unique, unique thing to do. And the most celebrated, I think, of those returns was after a sabbatical in 1959, where he stepped out at the top of the industry. <laughs> he stepped away from it all and started to work on his own playing and his own conceptions of music and jazz and harmony in particular, uh, and would just hang out at the Williamsburg Bridge and practice day and night. Uh, but he also took some harmony lessons a little bit of piano, and surrounded himself with a new cast of musicians, including the great guitarist Jim Hall. They made a record that changed everything, and I think opened a lot of people's ears to Sonny Rollins, who had thought of him as somewhat of a one-dimensional artist, unfortunately, at that point. And the most endearing of those tunes and those arrangements, I think, is their arrangement of God Bless the Child, which I've transcribed for our performance here. It featured Jim Hall, and we are so thankful to have the great Lindsay Miller in that role joining us today. This is God Bless the Child. Thank you. 
The great partnership of Sonny Rollins' early jazz careers with trumpeter Miles Davis. Miles Davis heard Sonny Rollins when he was still 19, still a teenager, and immediately asked him to join the band. Can you imagine that, being 19 and Miles Davis comes calling for you to join the band? They immediately had a friendship. Sonny Rollins says that he and Miles Davis liked the same singers. They liked the same musicians. Um, There was a kinship artistically there that made a lot of sense for them uh, as partners on the bandstand. One of the cool things about Miles Davis, especially at that point, and I think it lasted throughout his career, was a willingness to showcase the contributions of others. And in 1954, uh, there's a great Prestige Records release that is Miles Davis joined by Horace Silver, Percy Heath, and Kenny Clark featuring Sonny Rollins by name. Uh, It's a really incredible release. Uh, They play the standard, but not for me, the Gershwin tune, and then three pieces written by Sonny Rollins, which is really, really an incredible artistic stamp of approval from Miles Davis. We get Arigen, Olio, and Doxy, and now you'll hear us play two of those, Olio and Doxy. Enjoy. Bye. 
One of the things that sets Sonny Rollins apart from just about everyone else in jazz is that he has an ear for melody and a unique pacing as a thematic improviser. And that's that's the way that it's spoken of in, you know, jazz analysis classes. But what that means is that when you listen to Sonny Rollins, you are extremely aware that there is a story unfolding. Uh, it is never a technical display of chops or an intellectual display of language as a soloist. It is always a story unfolding. And I think there's no greater example of that than his playing on Blue 7, which is a blues that he improvised. And in truth, we, we now play the melody as he played it, but uh, as it's relayed to us by people that were in the room there, it, the whole thing was an improvisation. Uh, it's a slow tempo, which again speaks to the different ear of Sonny Rollins. I think Sonny Rollins is one of those jazz artists that can play any tempo, not just the fast ones. Um, A lot of times in jazz, we don't say it often enough, but fast tempos hide a lot and slow tempos are much more difficult to play. And this is a slow blues that really we see Sonny Rollins functioning at full power, uh, but not ever giving it all away in the moment. There's a constant unfolding, which we've tried to capture here with our performance of Blue 7. Thank you. 
Before we finish with one more piece from the pen of Sonny Rollins, I do want to thank the National Jazz Workshop for this incredible opportunity to go back through the life and times and contributions of a true giant in jazz, not just from a school study standpoint, but someone who personally has given me so much as an artist, uh, the great Sonny Rollins. We are going to conclude with a piece that saw Sonny Rollins stand toe-to-toe, and many might say even more than that, uh, with the great John Coltrane. This is Sonny Rollins' Tenor Madness. Thanks for watching.